The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. Karen, a lot of people on Twitter are talking about this Oregon Trail handheld game. Some people have suggested that we buy it, take it apart, and try to figure out what's inside. Well, yeah, obviously we have to do that. Right, I mean, it's only like 25 bucks, Target exclusive. Yeah, I have seen photos, it does have glop tops, so we might not be able to figure out everything about it, but I'll do my best. I think it's time to go to Target. All right, I'm gonna go to Target and see what's inside. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Should we take it for a spin? Inspired designs. Imhotep's priests. Regrettable acting. No one seems to get it. Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. All right, it's time to take a look inside of this Oregon Trail game. So this thing that's representing a disc, I guess, it's actually the power button. Wow. Screen's not very bright, but I guess, you know, what can you say for $25? So if this thing costs $25 in the store, that means it's probably worth like $4 in parts. All right, well, I did turn it on, so now I'm gonna take it apart. You know, you young whippersnapper kids might not remember the day Things never came with batteries. Now it seems like every toy comes with batteries. I guess the price of batteries is just probably low. These are probably gonna be like some China specials. Yep, GP, extra heavy duty. Sure you are. I wonder if it loses its place when you take the batteries out. So um, yeah, I had uh, some people on Twitter asking me to tear this down. Because apparently, well of course people have already taken this apart, but they haven't figured out how it runs yet. So I was playing this and the graphics don't match the Apple II. The Apple II had pretty terrible graphics. So this looks a little better than that. It also has a PCM sound, uh, like, you know, basically sampled audio of like, oh, it's a wagon, oh, it's a river. I suppose someone just went around like, you know, taping the sound of a river, like Rivers don't make that sound. They don't really make any sound if you think about it. Unless they're going really fast and it's like, but in this game, they're like, bloop, 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 bloop. it sounds like a fish being drowned, actually. All right, what's this? Wow, there's not much in this. I'm shocked. Well, let's continue to take it apart. Oh, this must be the uh, disk drive button. Oh, that's interesting. If you look back here, there's a little slit and that enables try me mode. Oh, try me mode is when it's in the store and this part of the plastic's exposed, so you can push the button and it gives you a little demo. I might as well rip out all the parts. Uh-oh, the spring. All right, so this thing has glop tops. So what a glop top is, is it's a epoxy covering for an ASIC. And an ASIC, well, I mean, an ASIC can be, you know, it can be in a, in a package as well, but uh, it's application-specific integrated circuit. So what they can do is they can uh, basically bond an integrated circuit to the PCB and then they cover it with a glop top or the black stuff to protect it. It's just a very inexpensive way of making uh, integrated circuit or putting an integrated circuit into something. You might recall in the Nintendo portable episode we recently did, the Nintendo on a chip, it also had an ASIC or a glop top. And remember back in the day when Nintendo had the uh, Super Mario Duck Hunt game that they included with every system? That was also using a glop top. All right, take a look at this. This isn't bad. We actually have a silicon pad, carbon, everything's, uh, there's, oh, there's a English and Mandarin versions of all the buttons, so that's actually pretty well labeled. That's good. So, you know, you could probably rebuild the co controls. Hey, we could rebuild this into Oregon Trail, portable or super portable. All right, let's say we got speaker and try me. So I think what I'll do is I'll desolder those to make it a little easier to take the rest of this apart. Okay, so I've seen people say, look at all the test points. You know, that could be used for something. Well, I mean, test points are, well, they're used for testing for one thing. So what they, they'll do is they'll have a bed of nails. It'll be like this board with a bunch of spring-loaded pins on it, kind of like pogo pins. And then when they're testing a board like this, they will set it on to the, uh, the bed of nails 
And then the bed of nails will run tests to make sure the board's good. Basically, it's an automated testing procedure. All right, so speaker, pretty much not much interesting there. All right. Oh, they got a little protective layer in front of the screen. That's nice. Okay, let's take a look. It's probably going to be... Okay, it's directly soldered. Well, you know, can't blame them for that. It's quite a few pins, which means this is probably not running in a serial mode. Uh, sometimes you'll see little displays like this one that I just happened to have right off camera. Uh, this is a, a serial display, basically. It, you know, you clock in data like you would with a, uh, a spy device. One thing that uh, I noticed right away with this, um, there's two main ASICs here. Then, well, you have, this is a power regulator. Yeah, it has to be because yeah, the power comes in here. You got your switch here. You've got a big cap here. Also, that looks like a power regulator. Uh, the thing that I find interesting is you have these two uh, SOIC 8 chips, and I'm wondering what those do. Felix, that Oregon Trail mm -hmm. game looks to have two different I squared C EEPROMs on it. One is pretty standard, the other one's kind of weird. Yes, I'm very curious. The signals look like they're I squared C, so I was thinking, why don't we try to dump them? And the fastest way to do that is with a Raspberry Pi. Hey, you know what? I got some, uh, I got the Raspberry Pi hooked up to a little test circuit here and I got some code. Let's try it out. Yeah, because there's, there's I squared C lines right here. Mm -hmm. And then Linux has things built into it so we can detect I squared C devices and also read and write to them. Mm -hmm. So can we detect what's on the bus? There yeah. could be 128 possible devices. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna ping all 128 locations and then see what responses it gets and then it'll tell us where our device is. Right now we just have a random, uh, probably microchip brand, um, 32K EEPROM hooked up to it. Yes, yeah, so we'll do sudo i2c detect mm -hmm. and then it's on bus one so we'll do dash y1. There cool. we go. It's on... Uh, 50. Yeah. Great. That's the address. All right, now can we dump it? All right, so we want to dump it. There's this program that I downloaded and compiled, uh, .eprong. Okay. I squared C detect is a program included with the distribution. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is what's on the Oregon Trail okay. for saving your game, an 8K uh, two-wire serial EEPROM. So I guess the question is, let's see if we can read 8K from this and route it to a file. So we're testing it with a off-the-shelf EEPROM before we use the actual ones, just in case we accidentally damage something. Oh, so the I squared C is just like any other device. Yeah. Oh. Okay, now we're so going to read, read it from 0x00 zero 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 to 8,000. Whoa. 0x 8,000. What do you want? What do you want to call this? this is the Wait, dump. I'm sorry. We don't need eight thousand. That's okay. too much. Do it two thousand. That'll 2, be eight k. Two thousand. Just put it. Dump it to a file. Dump dot text. Okay. Who's that? Was that Dunk? The uh, oh yeah. NSA? Dunk. All right. Cool. So Check it out. Take a little bit of time. It's reading the Takes a little contents time. of the EEPROM. Every single address oh, from zero zero to two thousand. All right. Why don't you uh, why don't you nano oh, that. that thing? No. How we cat it? Yeah, because Nano is going to try to display it as human-readable text, won't it? Yeah, go ahead and cat it. It's just going to spit it all out instantly. Well, it, look, it's still formatted it. So see, that wouldn't actually work as a hex dump because see how it's added this formatting into it, okay. like the address? Yeah, I'm going to see it now. Oh, yeah, okay, so it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's like an ASCII hex dump. So you don't want this first... No, little... that's fine. That's fine. I'm okay. just saying we couldn't just cold turkey take this and write it back because it's got oh, all these yeah. extraneous characters uh -huh. in it. Because that's not 255, that's the ASCII letters FF. Mm -hmm. Whereas like a lot of hex files, a hex file is different than a binary file. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. a hex file actually is like human readable ASCII, you know, FF, A0, B0, blah, 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 along with uh, pointers. Mm -hmm. So a hex file has to be parsed before it can actually be sent over directly into a chip. But binary is just raw data. I wonder if there's a way that this... Just e dump the bytes? Yeah. Mm. I have to, hey, how about we... Well, that's not the most important thing oh, okay. right now. So how about, you wanna, how about we read the, um, the save game memory first? Okay. Because that's the least important. I'm sure it could restore it if it needs to. All right, yeah. So, all right, so we know we can dump 8K. So what we're going to do is we're going to look for that. And then what I'd probably be looking for on the other chip is um, ASCII characters. Like, you have died of dysentery. Mm -hmm. Like, we should be able to see that in the ROM dump. And then we'll know if that chip is being used for main program storage or PCM sound effects or what, whatever. So can I take this and uh, restuff it? Sure.
Felix, I was looking up some information. Apparently the A1 and A0 lines on this EEPROM aren't connected to anything. Oh yeah? The only one that matters is A2. Okay, that sets the address that the Raspberry Pi will see when it looks at it? Right, so else. you could have two of these EEPROMs on the same bus and then you'd have one of them with A2 set to low and the other one for A2 set to high. Mm -hmm. And that would differentiate them. Okay. So the fact that they have um, three bits here, A2, A1, A0, makes you think you could have eight devices on the bus, but nope, two of these don't do anything. Okay. But that's probably why we're seeing four devices. Basically, mm -hmm. we're seeing uh, one device and then three nulls. Okay. So there's a response, but it's not necessarily what we want. Uh, yeah, so you found a way to do a binary dump. Okay, yeah, so in this EEPROG program here, mm -hmm. I can do, uh, well, actually, we had the, the tech X in there. Hex I just, mode. I, just, I took that out. Oh, okay. And, uh, so it just did a binary dump. Yep. All right, so dump uh, device 50. Device 50. Uh, dump it into a file. Yeah, so this will put it into the non-hex mode. Okay. You want it hex mode or not hex mode? Binary. All right. Okay. All right, let's see what we got. Okay, so cat. It says it has a 10-bit address uh, bus, which means 1,024 bytes. So this should be everything. Hey, look at that. Cool. Names of people who will die on the Oregon Trail. Hey, you can see some of my characters in there. Who do you got? Oh, look, it, it duplicates. See that? Look at that. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder if this also stores like how many bullets and how many oxen you have. You know what? You well, want to try changing some things? Yeah, it might be fun to like actually start a game and put in names and know how many bullets we have. And then yeah. we can compare it to the data here. I mean, this is clearly save game data. Right. Yeah, here's the first one that we did. Take a look at this. So we have the first page here, first 256 bytes. And we get up to A man, B man, and C man, and then the data loops around. Ah. So what was happening was, yeah, we were just basically looping the same area of memory. Here's the correct result where we accessed it as four different files and then concatenated them into one binary file. Wow, it's so cool that Linux can do that. This makes a lot more sense. As you can see, uh, it's only about half full. We have some, I guess, generic names that you could name your people. I don't know how you actually do that, like the built-in names. But then here's my crew, A man, B man, C man, D man, and E man. Uh, yeah. Cool, so this must be where the save data starts, at D0. If we look down here, see how this goes up to 3F0? So that basically means it goes up to uh, 400 in hex, which is 1,024 bytes. I have my notes here of how many provisions I put into my save game. 400 food pounds. Okay, so 400 is bigger than an 8-bit number. So let's type 400 in decimal and then switch it to hex. So that's gonna be 0190. So I wonder if we can find that pattern in here. Search for 0190 hex values. Okay, let's search for 90. Ah, found it. Oh, here we go, right here, look at that, see? Okay, so we have 90 and then 01. So it's a different order. So that is called, uh, that's Little Endian. So there's a thing in computers, it's, it's not Indian, it's Endian, which is a reference to Gulliver's Travels, how there's different people and they crack their eggs on either the little end or the big end, and it's one of those political allegories. Anyway, so if something is big endian, that means the big end of the number is stored in memory first. Whereas in this case, see how we have 0190? So the little end of it, the 90, that's stored in memory first, which means uh, this is a little endian processor, which is actually pretty common. So there we go, right there. That's how many pounds of food we have. So we can actually change that number to be more. It's like a game genie. We could have a million pounds of food. It would be like your average Texas buffet. I'm keeping track of all my food hacks with this handy text file here. All right, so I found the number 400. I changed it to FFFF, which is 65,535 pounds of food. Um, take a look at this. We have three ones in a row. So we have one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. So that tells me that it's using 16-bit values for pretty much everything, you know, two bytes, 16 bits. Look what's right before that. 64, zero, zero, 100 bullets. <laughs> uh, actually, this might be the oxen right here. Four oxen, five, oh yeah, five clothes. Yeah, I should be writing down these values. This is like 
good hacking information because of this, I'm sure everyone wants to hack this game so they can get to Oregon. I mean, I don't know about you, but I had a hard time getting to Oregon. Uh, so it's 16 bit values, little endian. Um, so we have three ones in a row here. This is probably wheels, axles, and tongues. But right before that, we have 64. And I'm pretty sure that's how many bullets I have. So I would put down 158 bullets. And I'm going to go ahead and change that to, you guessed it, the maximum number of bullets. <laughs> it's possible that if we make the number too high, the uh, graphics kernel might not be able to draw it. Uh, so we're going to go from 400 pounds food to a lot of food. We're going to go from 100 bullets to all the bullets. Uh, let's see. What else we got here? Four. That's probably the number of oxen because everything's grouped in the same area. It probably keeps these values in RAM. And then when you save the game, it just dumps the RAM image or a part of the RAM image to the I2C device. I'm going to guess this is the number of oxen. It's at 154. The oxen lamb kept time pa rum pa pom pom. I wonder how many oxen I could possibly give myself. Uh, you know what? <laughs> it's ridiculous. What would you do with that many oxen? You know what? I'm gonna. I'm not gonna be too greedy on this. I'm gonna go with um, 16 oxen. Yeah, that should work. Uh, so then after the oxen, five. So that could either be. Oh wait, no because we bought five boxes of bullets, so the only other thing that's five is five cloves. That's 156 is cloves. Okay, so let's go from five cloves to, maybe we're really, you know, we're like the Kardashians or something. So let's go with um, 42,000 cloves. I highly doubt this thing does a check to see if it'll actually fit in the wagon or not. So 42,000 would be, again, we have to do this little ending, so. We're going to go from five cloves to 10 A4 cloves. Yeah, so little end in, so that one's first, and then A4. Cool. So by the way, this is exactly how one would, uh, you know, hack a ROM normally. So when we write this back to the EEPROM, uh, we have to remember we're doing it in pages, so we're only going to want to write back, we're only going to want to write back this chunk to the second bank. I mean, we could write back everything, but as we mentioned before, uh, we want to make sure we hit the, hit the right memory addresses. So anyway, if I write back this chunk, it should work. Okay, Felix, I hear that you found the command to write to an EEPROM? Yes, I did. Did you get my hack file? Yes, I got your hack sort file. So let's test it by writing to a rando I squared C EEPROM we have laying around. So write 51, which means we're going to write 256 bytes or one page of data to device 51, which is basically device 50 bank 1. We're going to use 16-bit mode because this... Uh, it's a 16-bit address EEPROM, yes. as opposed to the other one. So when we, when we write it for reals, we'll want to switch it to 8-bit mode. Yeah. All right, so write it out and see what we get. Can you read it back? We should see D-man, E-man, and yeah, there it is. Cool. That's All it? Right. There's no more? Just D-man and E-man? What about A-man and B-man and C-man? They are in the first bank, remember? We're writing the second bank. All right, so when we write the second, it'll, it'll be is, uh It'll be 51, 51, and the offset will still be zero, 00. Okay. Because we're right into the start of the second bank. All right. Let me just double check the numbers, but I'm pretty sure that's right. All right, you ready to try it for real? Yeah, okay. Hey, the worst that can happen is it'll corrupt the data, and all right, I'm gonna plug it in. Okay, okay, so it's 51 I selected there. Yep, all right, let me just double check it. Eight. 8 bit mode, write 51, offset zero, 00. Yeah, go for it. All right. 8-bit mode, read device 51, yep, cool. Uh, read device 50, to make sure we didn't corrupt the earlier data. We should see the other people. Cool, it's A-man, B-man, and C-man. I told you they're still alive. All right, all right. I'm glad all right, that. so I think that works. So I'm gonna solder this back into the game and we'll see if the hack worked. I'm gonna solder the game save back in and then we'll see how many juicy bullets and oxen we can get. Your wife has died. Eat. All right, let's see if my hack worked. Yes! <laughs> look at how rich I am. Actually, take a look. Yeah, some of them are limited. See how bullets, I can only have 5,535 bullets. You know, otherwise I have to wait a day to buy more. Pounds of food has the same limit, see that? So it's a 16-bit number, but there is a, um, there's a kind of arbitrary limit on it. Oxen increases 16. 
All sets of clothing has a limit as well, see that? Not 42,000 sets of clothing, but 16. Oh, look at this, wagon wheels, axles, tongues, three, five, seven. So we know which ones those are now. Ha ha ha, sweet. Just thought of something. Five, five, three, five, food. That's not a max number. That's six, five, five, three, five, with only four digits showing. Ah, so, you know, your computer might have a number like 65535, which is also FFFF in uh, hex. But when it's drawing it on the screen, it actually has to turn it into a decimal number, then chop it up. It can't just say, oh, print, you know, 65535. It has to say, oh, first I print this digit, then this digit, then this digit, then this digit. And clearly in this, you know, program, it only prints four digits. So we actually do have 65,535 bullets. It's only printing the first four digits of that number. What's the matter, Karen? Why are you so sad? Well, it was really neat to watch you tear down this Oregon Trail portable, mm -hmm. but once we put it back together, I don't know if it's gonna be that fun to play. It's kinda, bulky and not very ergonomical and... It's designed to look like an old computer and not necessarily like be that playable. I wish there was something we could do about that. If only you worked with someone who had a lot of experience taking old systems and making them portable and smaller. <sighs> oh wait, you do. Me. I'll be back. Well, I guess I'll just sit here and mope over this uncomfortable handheld. It's Oregon Trail Pocket Edition. Look, it's so small and comfortable and fits in my hands. I've replaced the three AAA batteries with a modern day LiPo Ooh. with built-in charger. Now you can play Oregon Trail anywhere you go. Yeah, uh, so uh, it's got a LiPo battery now. It's got a nice big red button, just like an Atari for shooting the deer and buffalo and all the other animals you won't be able to carry back to your wagon. Wait. I have the perfect test. What? Does it fit in my pocket? You mean girl pockets? It fits! <gasps> it fits in my girl pockets. That's exciting. This is the perfect handheld game. But should we really encourage manufacturers to continue to make girl pockets? I mean, don't you want bigger pockets, right? I want bigger pockets. Hashtag bigger pockets. Hashtag bigger pockets. Yeah, I think the screen can be a little brighter, but they're probably doing it to save the battery. Well, you remember, well, maybe maybe you don't remember, but the other small LCDs that we use, sometimes they have like a 21 volt LCD with right, a boost. A this one's probably just using 3.3 volt backlight. That's why it's a little darker. Hold on, to get back to the menu. Continue game. So I think this is an emulator because if you look, there's some pixel scaling issues mm. with the text. I, oh. I'm pretty sure it's not a Nintendo on a chip yes. because it would, uh, yeah, see right there? See the word big blue river? Mm -hmm. See how the U looks thicker than the L? See, and look look at the 1848. Mm -hmm. So I think there's horizontal. Are those not two pixels wide? Like yeah, so I think it's it's emulated. Basically, it's not scaling correctly on the horizontal plane to emulation. So they're taking mm -hmm. something with a fixed resolution and then trying to scale it to whatever the screen is. The screen's probably like 320 by 240. That's all we have for today but it was really fun taking apart this Oregon Trail modern retro portable game. I've noticed there's a lot of these on the market now. They have Pac-Man, Q-Bert, and it's kind of cool because they all have little LCD screens. Yeah. Unlike the 80s where they had those uh, VFT displays where yeah. you know the characters were all like predefined. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. It's way better. Have you ever hacked one of these new vintage miniatures? What did you find? What did you make? 
Tell us about it on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. You can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time on the Trail to Oregon. I'm gonna go shoot some deer. Okay, oh, make yeah. sure you have the right tags for it. So I have my um, my notes here of how many provisions I bought for the trail to Oregon. Let's see. Hipster glasses, 10,000 Bob Marley albums, a Voodoo Donuts coupons. <laughs> I like to spend all my time in Frodo Park. Welcome to Frodo Park. A thief comes during the night and steals one pounds of food. Well, that why is it, that's not even worth the thief's time. 20 years ago, I made some really cool Doom levels, but now they're trapped on this ancient, obsolete zip disk. I want to see these levels. We need a zip drive. And a computer with a parallel port, which could be even harder to find. I know where we can get a computer with a parallel port. Hey, and we should look at the signals on the parallel port being sent to the zip drive using an oscilloscope. Felix, you have an old Dell computer here. Does it work? Ancient archaeology, isn't that kind of redundant? The Linux system, I know this.